Hi, I'm Phil Kagey, and as you can see, I'm here in my music room. Uh, this is uh, the, the place where I write my songs and, and uh, rehearse uh, and do my book work, do some reading, pay my bills. It's sort of an all-purpose room, if you will. Um, I'm surrounded by the tools of my trade and uh, all the equipment that I've been using recently and uh, some of the equipment I've used in the past. And uh, I'll just describe for you some of the stuff that I've used and am using at this present time. Um, first of all, I use a Furman PL8 power conditioner. That's what I plug all my AC, my amps, and my effects into. And I also use an Alysis XTC digital reverb. I use a Roland SDE 3000 digital delay, uh, which has presets and has a function on it that is called a Playmate, which is something you can use, which I use, to uh, lock in the, the millisecond time that I like to use with a particular repeat hold pattern. Uh, <clears throat> and it makes uh, working the delay a very practical functional use. I also use a TC Electronics 1210 stereo chorus flanger, and uh, it's a rack-mounted chorus device that has really sounded good. Uh, I use a Pierce G1 guitar amp preamp. Uh, it's a solid state amp, but I've used it uh, in recording and in concert. It's a very good sounding uh, piece of equipment. Uh, I am powering that Pierce preamp with a Mesa Boogie Simul Class Stereo 295 stereo amp. And um, it's all tube, and it has a good, clear sound. Um, I plug into two Mesa Boogie teal cabinets that have each a 112 EVM loudspeaker. Uh, and also, I use, especially on the last album that I just recorded called Phil Kagey and Sunday's Child, I use the Vox AC30 top boost amp that was built back around 1961. And uh, I find that's a very incredible sounding guitar amplifier. And also, uh, throughout the years, I've used uh, Yamaha G100-112 amps. Um, I'm using uh, what you would call a real generic homespun pedal board. The board that I'm using actually is usually used to sample carpets and stuff like that, so it's not really high tech. But when you put Velcro on it, you know, things change. And so I've got uh, attached to it uh, Velcro underneath some of my pedals and things like that. So they stick in case, you know, the stage turns sideways or goes upside down. Uh, I use uh, an Ernie Ball volume pedal. It's very dependable. And Mesa Boogie AB switch just to go to the tuner. Uh, from the tuner to the amp. <clears throat> you can also use the AB switch to go from one amplifier system to another for the variety of sounds. Or you can also use the AB switch to plug two separate guitars in and the single out, you see. You can switch from guitars. I, I use a Roland three-way on and off switch, which is just for on and off uh, for the, the delay, and it shuts the chorus off. And it also has a, a, a button that I use to put in the repeat hold function of the digital delay. Also, I use a Roland DP2 foot switch that uh, advances my presets on my digital delay. I also have the one that I, that I use for the Playmate function, which is what zeroes my digital delay in milliseconds. And as you tap in time on, then off, you can lock in the exact tempo in which you're playing in. I also use the Pierce AB switch, and most modern amplifiers have that kind of switch for your amps from clean channel to your overdrive channel. And I've been using this Boss Octaver, this OC2. Uh, it's a very inexpensive way to add a bit of bottom end to your guitar parts. Uh, with the Ebo, it, it makes for a very interesting sound. Uh, it's from going from like whatever a cello sound to a double bass sound. Um, and then when you lock in a repeat hold function, uh, you can actually put a, a little bit of a bass pattern on tape or on the delay. I also use uh, the Boss TU-12 chromatic tuner. You just never know when one of your ears are going to go, so you got to have something to tune to. Uh, one of those kind of tuners, not everybody knows about them, but they're really good because you don't have to turn any buttons. You just play the note, and it'll indicate to you whether you're sharp or flat on a particular note. And it's quite handy if you just uh, push an A-B switch while you're in concert or you're working with your band, it, it won't come out of your amp. It'll just come into your tuner and you can read your tuning rather than listening to it. So, uh, there you have it. It's uh, nothing super fancy, but uh, it works for me for the time being. I'm going to be sharing with you some solos from, from some of the albums that I've recorded over the past. And um, before we do so, I'd like to 
help you get tuned here so we can be in the same key. Uh, first of all, here's an E, B, G, D, A, Q. I mean E. <laughs> all right, great. The song that uh, we're going to be listening to is called Passport from the Getting Closer album I recorded some years ago. And it's the middle solo that, uh, that I play. And I'll be playing with some tracks. And uh, this particular guitar that I'm playing is a Zion guitar. It's not the guitar used on the solo, but it's made by Zion Technology in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it's got two Seymour Duncan JB humbucking pickups that can be split or single coil or parallel uh, or full humbucking. Uh, it's got a Kaler bar, uh, tremolo unit and all that. And it's a, a real good guitar. I used it a lot over the last couple of years. So anyway, let's roll the tape and let's see what happens, okay? Okay, I'm going to show you how I did this solo. Uh, in this solo, I used some techniques of uh, uh, hammer-ons and pull-offs and a sweeping technique uh, with the right hand in the picking. I also utilized the whammy bar uh, to create the, the note coming up and uh, bending upwards. And so I'll show you how, how I did this. <laughs> I'll play it for you one more time, even a bit slower. I'd like to do a song for you off the Getting Closer album. It's an instrumental called Riverton. And, uh, it was written back when I was touring in 1984 uh, through the state of Wyoming, There's a little town called Riverton there. I wrote it with Richard Souther, and I'd just like to sit here and play it for you.
some people ask me, you know, how did you write that song or why did you write that song? Uh, it's an instrumental, and um, I was on tour in Wyoming uh, through the United States, and we happened to be stopping through Wyoming, and there was a little town there called Riverton, and I think it was about 11.30 at night, and I went out for a run with a friend of mine uh, who was on the tour with me, and uh, I was rooming with Richard Souther, and uh, he's the keyboard player who co-wrote the song with me. I had this drum pattern on the drum machine. I said, I've got this pattern, uh, and it's got some interesting moments to it. Could you come up with some chords? And uh, I'll just leave it with you. I had the little four track with us on the road in the hotel room. And uh, he said, OK, I'll work on it. So I went out for about just a half hour, and I came back. And he had all the chords uh, not only composed for the song, but, but put on the tape for me. And uh, then we put a bass part on it. The next day, we're on our way in the, in the bus. And I just plugged the, the, the four track into the generator outlet for AC. And I got my little Rockman out, my guitar out, and just put down that very lead. And uh, so, so it gives me a sense when I think, when I listen to it, or when I play the, the, the solo, it just takes me back on the road when we were going through all those cornfields. You know, so that's how that happened. In the 70s, I became more familiar with uh, other kinds of guitar players. Uh, I thought, uh, first time I heard Eric Johnson, I was really knocked out. Um, Anthony Phillips style which you know, most people don't know who Anthony Phillips was, but he was great. And, uh, and then Pat Metheny, I, I got real into Pat Metheny, and when I got my Yamaha guitar, I used to do and try to do things that sounded Metheny-ish. Okay, that was the first solo. You heard a classical guitar possibly in there. It's because the electric and the classical were going at the same time. Not at the same time. Of course, different times, overdub. Uh, so this is how this particular solo goes. It goes like this. At the same time, I heard about Alan Holdsworth and heard his, his style of playing. And um, even though I couldn't comprehend 98% of what he was doing, uh, the emotion of what he played really, really affected me. And that's why in some of my songs, some of my solos, you might hear some things, some nuances, some expressions, uh, um, you know, that, that come through, whether it was with a whammy bar or whether it was a, a kind of a... Uh, kind of line or, or phrase or something. Okay, this is a slowed down version of that second solo. Uh, ladies, get your guitars. <laughs> okay. I can only say uh, that we're all influenced by various guitar players, and none of us are completely original, yet all of us have our own individuality and our own personality in our playing. So you can be influenced by so many kinds of guitar players, but if you just become dedicated in your own right, you'll have your own expression, and that's important to be able to be yourself and not try to be some other guitar player.
going to change guitars here and uh, put on this 1965 Fender Strat that I've used over the years, ever since 1976, when I found it at a music store up in Ithaca, New York. Uh, this guitar I used on this next piece for the rhythm track. Uh, the song is called Follow Me Up, and uh, I'm going to show you how I did this rhythm pattern on it. On my digital delay, which is a Roland SDE 3000, I've got it set at 357 milliseconds with one repeat, only one regeneration. And uh, that creates the slap and the bounce that you hear like that. So I'll give you an example of how this rhythm pattern is done. It's a very simple rhythm pattern, uh, but it's fun to do with the, the repeat going on. That's from Follow Me Up. And I'm going to play along with the track now so it all gels together, okay? That song really takes me back to the 70s. Doesn't it take you back there, too? Anyway, um, I'm going to show you a little riff here that I did in that song that I also used in another place. I think it was Passport. Uh, it's kind of a chromatic line that's just kind of fun to do. And uh, so it goes like this. I'll play it for you, and then I'll play it slowly. OK, that's how it goes. Uh, let me do it one more time, but I'll do it slowly. I'll do it even slower this time. This next uh, solo is from the song Train to Glory that I recorded on the Play Through Me album. And I'll play along with the track and then I'll break things down and do parts of the solo a lot slower for you, okay? That solo seemed like it was doubled, just because it was. <laughs> I was playing along with the lead that was already on the tape. Uh, but that's quite a challenge. Now you get a chance to do it. I'm going to slow the solo down, and 
uh, let you in on how I did it, okay? Not that it's a great secret, but uh, if you're interested, here you go. In this section here where these hammer-ons are, it's kind of fun to do this, and I'll show you how you do it. You start on the B, the B note on the E string. So you can hear I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, pulling off these strings to the open E and B string, like that. And so there's a... can kind of get that and uh, if I ever forget it I'll come look you up okay <laughs> well, about 1975 I wrote a song called time and over the years uh, it's been requested many times at concerts, and so I'll uh, give you a part of uh, what this song is about here. Give you an idea how the little line goes here. was continually influenced by the music of the 60s. A lot of British groups, the Kinks, those guitar sounds in those days. Um, Jeff Beck was a major influence. And then when, uh, when I started really listening to blues music, I listened to Paul Butterfield Blues Band, and I listened to Mike Bloomfield in particular. Uh, I think Michael Bloomfield was one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived who put into blues playing uh, such a feel, and, uh, but made it relatable. And, uh, and as a teenager, his guitar playing just totally knocked me out. Uh, there was one particular solo that he did on an album called uh, A Long Time Coming. The solo was on a song called Another Country. And I used to just sit around and play along with those licks or the whole entire album. Super Session was another album that he did that I, I learned a lot of things from. is slow.
Uh, going back some years to the album I did back in 1980, it's called Flipside. There's a song in there called uh, Just a Moment Away. And I'm going to play for you, along with the track, uh, the solo that I did in that song. I'm going to change guitars here and go to the ye old Les Paul. The one I used back uh, ever since Glass Harp times. We're talking, you know, 1971 with this guitar when I got it. And it's still a great playing guitar. So I think we're going to roll the tape here. OK, ready? This old guitar came with uh, smaller pickups, smaller humbuckings that they were making in those days. And I got a regular Gibson P PAF pickup here. And Paul Reed Smith, one of his fellows that uh, works for him, I think Corky is his name, built this pickup for me, hand spun it, hand wired it, hand coiled it, however you say it, you pickup makers, you. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm going to slow this uh, solo down for you. and. Uh, it's basically a pretty straight ahead solo. Doesn't take a whole lot of concentration. Just a lot of volume. Okay. On my Town to Town album, I did a song called Full Circle. And I'd like to show you how the first introduction solo to that song goes. And so I'll do it for you without accompaniment. And then I'll break it down into little parts of the solo for you. And I'll do it slowly, if possible. Uh, OK, so it goes like this. go something like that. So what I'm going to do is slow it down and do the first part of it, which goes like this. One more time. OK. And then once you've got that part, you add this to it. What that is is kind of a, like that. You just do that. OK, so here we got. Go watch you don't go too sharp. So when you go, that sounds better. OK, then we add. we have back and boy is it a hot day out here in California. Um, I've got my SA2000 which is made by Yamaha Instruments and I got this guitar back in 1980 and over the years I've used it on many recordings and I've toured with it. It's a very sweet sounding guitar. It's, uh, it plays really well. I, I enjoy playing it and um, I'm going to just 
explore on it a little bit. And one of the things I'd like to explore with is the Evo that I've been using ever since about 1977. It's a, it's a very creative little device that uh, basically contains a battery and some electronics. And uh, it's designed by Heat Sound Products. And uh, I'll give you an example of exactly how it works. And uh, perhaps get into one of the things I've enjoyed doing over the years, and that is my guitar Ebo version of Amazing Grace.
Now this guitar is very inspiring to play and over the years I've found a lot of, I took a lot of pleasure in just being spontaneous on it and making things up and so that piece that I had just done uh, has excerpts from things I've done over the years and, uh, and other things that I haven't done until just this moment but um, I used a couple other techniques that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one of them is the volume control uh, which, which, you know, using my little finger on my right hand on the volume control, uh, basically I pick with the volume down and as the note rings out, I bring the volume up. And uh, on this guitar, I had the volume knob, the potentiometer, and the, the toggle switch reversed, changed, so that I could have access to this. Uh, also, if you have a two pickup guitar such as this or a Les Paul that has the same configuration of pickups and knobs, which what I do in this <clears throat> middle position of the toggle switch, I turn the the rhythm volume all the way down and have the the volume on the bridge pickup all the way up like this. Tones wide open, if you care. And then I start from zero. And then with a digital delay, you can create a lot of effects and parts and layer your, your uh, parts that you're putting on. And um, so that's one of the techniques that I use. The other one is um, using harmonics. And what I do is simply, I tap the strings with my first finger on my right hand, uh, approximately 12 frets up. Like if I'm hitting an E chord right here, and I go, you can hear that. Um, And eventually, as you get into tapping, you know, you're tapping chords, you can get into individual notes tapping like this. But I like to uh, also do various kinds of sweeps with a harmonic thing, like, uh, like say, an A minor chord up here. Okay, while I've got the Yamaha guitar on, um, I'll be doing a, a solo from The Wind and the Wheat, which is the title track, and it's a middle solo that I use this guitar on. Uh, I've been doing some volume stuff and, you know, showing some of that technique. And uh, I'll be using that particular technique in this solo. Uh, I have also want to bring to your attention, in case you haven't noticed already, yes, I have lost a, a finger on my right hand. Um, when I was four years old, it was a farm accident that uh, I climbed up on this water pump and it, it just sort of fell over and broke through and uh, left me sold to this way, you see. But I didn't give up and when I was at the age of 10, I began to pick up the guitar and play it and uh, I've just sort of been into it ever since. So if you're missing any fingers, it doesn't mean you can't uh, be a guitar player or a musician of any sort. As a matter of fact, you could probably uh, be a typist if you wanted to. but. Uh, Bowling can be a little difficult, you know. So anyway, um, I'm going to proceed to do this solo for you, and I hope uh, you can get something out of it. It's one of my favorite songs that I've ever recorded, The Wind in the Wheat. So uh, here we go.
uh, bringing this uh, solo down a little bit slower, um, I'll show you how I did this. I'd like to do for you uh, a little bit of happy, some of the particular lines that are in that song. Uh, of course, the introduction is a harmonic thing that goes. And then it's got uh, the, the, the R&B groove part thing that happens. But there's a, I do sort of a, a sl I do a slide uh, bottleneck thing that goes like this. I don't have a slide here, so I'll just have to duplicate that with the whammy bar. So it just goes like that. Like that, okay? Then it goes into a solo thing that sounds like this. There's one more part that has this little bitty ditty that goes to it. So I'll do that real slow for you here. What I've done is picked up this little guitar here that um, I've used off and on over the years. Uh, this guitar was a gift to me from my friend Kerry Livgren. And uh, so back in 1980, I began to use it in, in certain sections of songs. Uh, I used it in songs like Our Lives and The Survivor and uh, From Shore to Shore. And, uh, and particularly, this particular song called Paid in Full from the Underground album. And uh, I used this guitar in the middle solo section of that song. And so I thought I'd, instead of playing the whole song uh, with the other guitar, I would do just that middle section uh, to give you an idea of how it sounds and, and uh, an idea of how you can actually uh, space your notes on this particular guitar. Because it is 22 frets, but it's scaled down. It's a whole octave higher than a standard guitar. And uh, so it can really sound chimey, you know. So anyway, uh, it can really get some high notes, too. You know, like that. So anyway, I'm going to play this section here for you, and uh, hope you like it.
as the surf music thing happened, you know, and when the safaris came out, and when the challengers, uh, the astronauts, uh, Dick Dale and the Dale Tones, uh, you know, the, the Beach Boys, in fact, you know, those guitar sounds as I was about fifth grade, uh, and it had to be around 1962, 63, that time, that was an influence upon me, you know, encouraged me to keep playing music. I got more excited about the guitar. And uh, I can remember the first time I ever saw Dick Dale on TV playing Miser Lou. I just couldn't believe it. Or Surf Beat, one of those songs. Uh, see, there was a, a song called Pipeline and Boss. Those songs, those songs from the, the surf days, you know, I was very heavily into that kind of guitar sound. I got a Fender Stratocaster. That was a 1961 Stratocaster. And um, I got very much into playing that style of music for a while. Uh, inc incidentally, I was raised in Ohio, but during those years I was living out here in Buena Park, California. And uh, so this is where the action was, so to speak, with the surf music and that whole thing. Th but then, boom, you know, uh, the Beatles came out. You know, I Want to Hold Your Hand, uh, Love Me Do, Please Please Me, and those particular kind of songs. When I heard the kind of sounds that they were making, not only with their guitars but with their voices, I, I, got, I got more excited and I began to... Uh, you know, be influenced by that style of guitar playing. Not only George Harrison's guitar sound, which was predominantly a Gretsch and a Rickenbacker 12-string in those days, but John Lennon's sound, which was a Rickenbacker, he had a great rhythm sound and a very, uh, that real strange honky sound that came through the boxes in those days, like I want to hold your hand. All right, this is a, a guitar that um, my brother Dave had loaned to me that I could use on the newest album that I just recorded called Sunday's Child. and. Uh, he actually just ended up giving it to me. What a nice guy you are, Dave. Anyway, this guitar is a guitar I actually learned to play on when I was about 12, 13 years old. Um, I actually used this, this particular guitar in my first band that I was in. And so it's been around a long time. And, uh, but here I am, sort of coming full circle with it being one of the very first instruments I ever played to being one of the guitars used quite a lot on the newest album that I just recorded. So this is a solo from a song that Mark Hurd wrote that's on the new album, Sunday's Child. The song is called I Always Do, and this little section is the guitar solo toward the end of the song. Um, this guitar, which I used on that solo in the album, I also ran it through a Vox AC30 that was built in the early 60s. And it was those particular combination of sounds back then that made me want to play guitar to begin with. And so anyway, uh, I really think that, you know, even though it doesn't stay in tune, like a lot of the new guitars with the lock nut and the Kalers and the Floyd Roses and all that, it still has a lot of character. So I think uh, I cover that concerning this guitar. I've got one more solo that I'd like to do for you. I just set this here. And this is from a, a song called This Could Be the Moment. And uh, it's, uh, it was originally done on a telly, uh, this solo. But I used the Strat here for this. In closing, I'd like to leave you with this song. It's a song that's from my newest album, uh, Sunday's Child, and this song is called Tell Me How You Feel. This isn't the actual recording on the record, but it is uh, a song that we went into the studio, uh, some good friends of mine, and we played it together, and some friends from Holland came over and uh, shot the video for this. 
And uh, so here you have it. I hope you enjoy the song, and I've enjoyed spending this time with you. And uh, tune in again sometime, okay? Bye-bye. Tonight, tonight, tonight.